for the purposes of preparing the minutes. Hey, Dean, can I just uh, ask a really quick question? Are we allowed to have staff on here or is that not allowed? Yeah, no, Please. staff are, yeah. are welcome, right? Right, I, I didn't invite any of them until I got the permission. So it, it's, it's a public meeting as well, right? So um, there could be others tuned in, listening to and watching everything that we have to say today. So uh, of course, keep that in mind, right? Um, okay, so <laughs> to proceed with the meeting, I'll now turn it over to Chair of the Mass Gaming Commission, Kathy Judstein, for some introductory comments, right? How about that? Well, thank you, Chairman uh, Serpa. And um, before I let Dean dive into the great agenda he has for you today, I, I do want to take a moment to personally welcome and introduce him as the new chair of the GPAC. Uh, <clears throat> chair, Ser chair Serpa was appointed to the GPAC by Governor Charlie Baker in January of this year. Dean has served in the administration of four governors of the Commonwealth filling key roles in the executive office as well as various cabinet offices and agencies. During his tenure in state government, Dean brought his particular expertise in crisis management, event management, marketing technology, security, and internal compliance to his various roles. Most notably, Dean served as deputy chief of staff for operations and administration within the governor's office, Acting Director of the Executive Office of Economic Development, Director of the Massachusetts Office of Business Development, and Chief Marketing Office for the Massachusetts Convention Center Authority. I personally have had the pleasure of working with Dean throughout my career, and I'm confident that he will bring his keen eye for detail and process and vast knowledge of business development to this new role. Congratulations, Dean, and welcome. I also. Thank you very much, Kathy. I also quickly want to introduce Grace. Join Robinson. the meeting. Oh, we have um, another um, a member just joining. Good afternoon, Anne Margaret. Good afternoon. Um, I also um, want to, and she said, she told me to say quickly, I don't want to do it quickly, but I want to introduce Grace Robinson, who recently joined the MGC as Chief Administrative Officer to the Chair and Special Projects and External Relations Manager, and she will be um, really connecting with legislative affairs as well at the MGC, so note that to Join our, the meeting. our legislative um, colleagues here. Grace is taking over for Crystal Boschman who has moved on to an exciting new role as sports wagering business manager at the Gaming Commission. I know that many of you will share my appreciation for Crystal's work, assisting me in the GPAC for the last few years, and you'll hear from her shortly. Grace joins us after serving eight years in Governor Baker's operations department, most recently as the director of operations for the Office of the Governor. She joined the Baker Polito administration after graduating from the University of Richmond as the briefing coordinator. And like Chair Serper, I also had the pleasure of working with Grace previously, and I'm so delighted she has joined the MGC too. Now, um, I'll turn back to you, Chair Serper. Do you want me to provide updates now or do we turn to the minutes first? Oh, you're on mute. No, nope, we're going to move. We're going to move along into uh, some comments and minutes, and then back to you, Kathy. Okay, and, thank you. Uh, of course, I would like to welcome Grace as well, having worked with her uh, a lot in the past, and I know that uh, she will keep everything for the committee organized, well run, and make sure we are performing at the best that we can as an organization. So, welcome, Grace. <clears throat> And Kathy, thank you for that warm introduction. I've enjoyed, of course, all of the time that I have worked with you and others in the recent administration and other administrations. And I look forward to working with the full GPAC members, the other gaming commission commissioners, of course, and all of the staff at the gaming commission um, as we continue the advancement of this 
important industry here in Massachusetts, right? So I am looking forward to that. Um, I should mention to the group, um, as an introduction to my chairmanship, um, a few weeks back, I did take an introductory tour of the state's three gaming properties along with the chair and Brace. And I certainly left each property being extremely impressed with the work being done across the licensees, really. Um, I, I experienced firsthand the obvious commitment and expertise of the, the gaming commission staff that I met in each facility. You know, we had a, a person for each facility who brought us through, as well as other staff that I met. I experienced sort of an ever present positive energy from all of the staff and facility employees that I met, which was um, fun to feel and see. And uh, I would say overall, what, what, what hit me was the large number and variety of employment opportunities that the facilities represent, right? Getting to see that firsthand. Of course, we know it, we've seen the presentations, but um, I met dozens of employees of every different type and at every different level. And, and that just was energizing to me personally. We saw uh, training activities, right? right in front of us for new employees. And um, almost every room that we went into, I heard stories from the staff there about job ca career advancement that had happened once they had come to Massachusetts and worked into, in, in one of these facilities. So those are good stories to hear and I enjoyed it. For any of the other new gaming policy advisory committee members, if you haven't had a chance to visit one or all of the properties, uh, I certainly encourage you to do so. But with that, <laughs> let's move on with today's meeting. Um, I guess I should check to make do a roll to make sure we have the quorum, right? Is that right, Grace? All right. Yeah. So uh, Mass Gaming Commission Chairperson, Kathy Judstein. Are you present? I needed to unmute. Yes, here I am. Right. Thank you. Senator uh, Barry Feingold. I, I am I am here. I'm happy to be here. I'm present. Great. Senator Ryan Fatman. Representative Ann Margaret Ferrente. I saw you on the screen. Representative. Okay, Representative Marcus Vaughn. I'm here. I'm here. I just couldn't unmute the button. I'm here. Great, thank you, Representative. Representative Vaughn. Present. Uh, Victor Ortiz. Present. Uh, Commissioner Helen Carlton Harris. I Present. Saw you. Present. Uh, Mr. Pignelli. I'm here. Present. Mr. McNeil. Present. Uh, Ms. Sprague, Caitlin Sprague, didn't see her. Okay, and I, Dean Serpa, am present. Uh, Grace, I think that gives us a quorum, right? We can continue, yes? Yes, we may. All right, great. And just generally, I should start the meeting, of course, by recognizing and welcoming our other new committee members, Senator Feingold, and Representative Vaughn, uh, Jamie McNeil, and Caitlin Sprague. So welcome to the committee, all of you, and I appreciate your commitment. Would any of you, would any of our new members like to offer a few words of introduction of yourselves or your hopes for the committee? I'm happy just to say really quickly that I just, you know, have, happy to be here. Um, if, if you know my ba background, I haven't been the biggest fan of gaming, but that's okay. Um, what I'm really concerned about is making sure that we don't hurt people and we, we, you know, we move forward and we make sure that we do have protections in place. Uh, I will say I'm very concerned about what I see with uh, young people and their online betting. Um, so that's what I hope that we can at least talk about. I know we have a presentation about that. So, um, but as chair of economic development, I know gaming is part now part of our uh, fabric here in the Commonwealth. And 
I understand that and uh, will be as supportive as I can about that. Great. Well, thank you, Senator. Uh, welcome to the committee. And then hopefully we'll be able to, to work together to help um, bring all the information necessary to bear. Any other comments, introductions by new members? Representative Marcus Vaughn here. I uh, just want to say thank you for allowing me to be a part of this uh, committee. And um, uh, as far as uh, gambling is concerned, um, not, not a big gambler myself, but have been involved in the gaming industry for quite a while um, on the security side of, of the business. Um, so I have some inner workings with uh, regional uh, stakeholders and casinos uh, all across New England. Um, but very much looking forward to learning more and making sure that we have the proper safeguards in place uh, to assure that this is a thriving industry and people are protected. Of course. Thank you, Representative. Anyone else? Any other new members? Chair Sarp, I'll just introduce myself. Um, thank you for the opportunity and thank you, uh, Chair Judd Stein. Um, for all your help and kind of getting me acclimated. Um, my name is Jamie McNeil. Um, I'm the general agent for Unite Here Local 26, where the union that represents um, the gaming workers at the Encore Casino. So it's about 1,200 workers and another additional 200 under um, Teamsters Local 25. Um, so I don't, you know, I I remember when the when the when the law was passed and it was a much um, I, sh I shouldn't say darker day because it's pretty gloomy out there today, but, um, you know, the real emphasis was on jobs and economic development. And um, as, as, as the Senator said, and, you know, that's particularly my focus. I'm also on the board of a training center that um, has helped um, not just fill in the gaps of all the workers who went to go work for Encore, but um, trains, trains workers for Encore itself. So um, it's an honor to be on this uh, uh, commission and thank you so much. Well, thank you, Jamie, and I know we'll hear more about it uh, later today. Okay, without any other intros, I think I will now turn the meeting back over to Chair Judd Stein for a quick update now, Kathy, on the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. And Kathy, you're on mute. I'm on mute. Um, thank you, Dean. And as this time, I'd also like to acknowledge former GPAC chair, um, Magnesia Cohen, for um, our record. She convened this body regularly, helping to provide the MGC with valuable input and guidance, and we appreciate her leadership. Um, and I also want to extend my welcome to our new GPAC members. Continue our introductions. I would like to take a quick minute to introduce our newest commissioner, Jordan Maynard, who officially joined the MGC on August 1st, 2022. That's the day the legislature laid the sports wagering bill on the governor's desk. While Commissioner Maynard has been serving our commission for nearly one year now, he has yet to be formally introduced to this body. Former Governor Charlie Baker then, Attorney General Maura Healy and Treasurer Gold, uh, Goldberg, Deborah Goldberg appointed Commissioner Maynard to the commission position slated for an individual with experience in the legal and policy issues related to gaming. Jordan most recently served as Governor Baker's Chief Secretary and Director of Boards and Commissions. During the COVID-19 pandemic, he served as the Washington DC Director for the Office of the Governor, working to coordinate state agencies interactions with the federal government and supporting the procurement of millions of pieces of PPE for the Commonwealth. A proud native of Kentucky, he is a graduate of Moorhead State University and obtained his law degree from Northern Kentucky University's Sam P. Chase College of Law. Welcome, Jordan, and would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I recognize a lot of faces and a lot of names over uh, my years in the governor's office, and um, appreciate being able to um, be here today. Uh, also, congratulations um, to Chair Dean Serpa, who I know uh, is the most organized and the most detail-oriented person I ever worked with in my career. So I know we're in good hands, as well as Grace, um, who's, who's also uh, just fantastic. 
Um, thank you, uh, Chair Judd Stein, and um, uh, I look forward to hearing what we're doing today. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Maynard. And so, uh, Chair Serpa, I you know, ask too that I give a few MGC updates. We'll start with sports wagering. I want to acknowledge first the tireless work of my fellow commissioners, many who are here today, um, and Executive Director Wells, who's here. You can give a wave. And uh, the entire team at the Gaming Commission to stand up the new sports uh, betting industry within six months of the law's enactment to really maximize the benefits to the Commonwealth and minimize the risk. It wasn't lost on me as one you know, of five commissioners that while some may have been concentrating on the revenues that legalized sports wagering might produce for the state, as well as repatriating dollars from neighboring states, we also were establishing a regulated um, market and um, giving consumers of sports wagering that legal market, regulated market, um, before two significant sporting events, offering um, the consumer protections that come with um, the regulated market and it's not prioritized in the very well-established illegal market. <clears throat> we have, um, in the course of our sports wagering, we interviewed and assessed 14 applications. Five commissioners were from the start, united in our priorities and values. Over the course of lengthy public meetings that extended at times beyond seven hours, we evaluated the prospective operator's commitment to the high integrity, innovative consumer protections and responsible gaming tools, the state of the, the art technology, and the applicant's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and community engagement. The commission was united in viewing a sports wagering license in Massachusetts as a peerless privilege and expected invested community partners. We benefit from external input from stakeholders, experts, elected officials, and the general public holding over uh, seven round tables that produced guidance on a host of sub subject matters, including advertising, the Players Association's perspective, marketing, and of course, responsible gaming. We um, have promulgated what we believe is a bold advertising regulation that pushes the limit of the sports wagering law and the First Amendment. And to Senator Feingold's important point, works to prioritize the safety and well being of those not eligible to wager, particularly those under the age of 21 and our most vulnerable populations, including individuals who voluntarily self-exclude from gaming, including sports wagering. We continue to seek commentary from stakeholders and the public and remain humble and nimble, poised to pivot to establish what we hope is a best-in-class regulatory framework and fulfills the expectations of the legislature and the governor who signed this into law. On to horse racing. My fellow commissioners and I were thrilled to attend opening day at Plain Ridge Park last month. We're looking forward to a great horse racing season this year and don't miss out on Derby Day on Saturday. Um, we as a commission are also reviewing thoroughly our racing and regulatory framework and proposed regulatory improvements. Uh, that, um, work that will be ongoing, but actually coming right up uh, in future, our future uh, public meetings. Uh, we also want to note that we celebrated at uh, MGM Springfield the one year anniversary of Play My Way, as well as uh, acknowledging Problem Gambling Awareness Month. Uh, we did that in March, celebrated the one year anniversary of Play My Way, which is that innovative budgeting tool to promote responsible gaming. All five commissioners attended that celebratory event to mark the occasion and highlight our commitment and honestly, the all three of the um, casinos, um, a longstanding commitment to problem gambling awareness month. And then this month, the commission will be reviewing the community mitigation fund applications. In fact, we just um, reviewed two, uh, perhaps one that um, changed to one of our, our members. I'll let him speak to that later. 
Um, and I'm proud to announce that this year we received a record number of applications. Uh, Paul, I know it's of great interest to you. We received 58 applications this year, totaling a request for $16.2 million. So the Community Affairs team worked collaboratively with Mark Vanderlinden and Dr. Bonnie Andrews this year, a new development to uh, develop a new category aimed at uh, gaming harm reduction. This category allows communities to create research proposals and conduct community engaged research to help them further understand the impact of gaming on their communities. And then the CA um, and Community Affairs team also created a new category called Projects of Regional Significance, which was designed to address projects that could have a large impact on multiple communities surrounding the gaming establishments. You'll hear more from Chief Joe Delaney and his team at the next Chief meeting uh, to be able to give a fulsome update on our community mitigations. And at this point, I think I'll turn it back to uh, Chair Serpa. All right. Thank you, Kathy, for those, uh, for those updates. And of course, welcome to Commissioner Maynard, uh, even though it's been just about a year. Um, I think I'm supposed to move to the approval of the minutes from the prior two meetings, but Grace, I think we're one short. Is that right? Yes. While we do have a quorum of GPAC members, we unfortunately do not have a majority of folks who were present at the previous two meetings. Um, if Senator Fatman is able to join us uh, during the meeting, I'll, I will interject and hopefully we can take that vote then. But um, for now, we will take them in draft form. Okay. So we'll, um, we can move on then uh, with today's, um, today's agenda. Uh, so at this point, I will now turn the meeting over to Councillor Todd Grossman, General Counsel of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission for a review of the Commonwealth's ethics policy and how it relates to our committee and to us individually as committee members. Uh, Todd, feel free. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all uh, for having me. It's a great pleasure uh, to be with you here today. Uh, as General Counsel of the Commission, one of my functions is to ensure that uh, members of our team are familiar with uh, the ethics laws that govern their conduct as state employees. Um, and what we do with our full-time employees is offer an annual training that covers both the state conflict of interest law Gaming has, um, and I'm sorry if I just froze there. Um, it, just uh, signal me if that happens again. Um, I won't uh, go through our full hour long uh, ethics presentation for you all unless there's a request to do so. Um, instead, I'll offer the uh, presentation that I've prepared for uh, committee and subcommittee members. I've offered this uh, a number of times over the years, uh, and I've refined it to include those areas that the, the members tend to find uh, the most useful. So without further ado, with your indulgence, I do have a PowerPoint uh, uh, presentation that I'll just put up here on the screen. I'll walk through all of these principles and certainly invite anyone who has any questions to just jump right in uh, since I won't be able to see you along the way. Uh, before I, I do that, I just also wanted to add that I am certainly available at any time uh, uh, after the meeting or, or over the course of the year, if you have any questions uh, specific to your circumstances that I could be of assistance with, happy to help you navigate uh, through uh, some of these issues. So without further ado, um, if I may, let's see. here we go. Okay, oops. So um, advisory committees created pursuant to section 68 of the gaming law, which is what this uh, committee is, is considered a state agency, which makes the members of this committee a state employee for purposes of the conflict of interest law. Um, and because you are not uh, full-time employees of the commission, you would be considered special state employees. 
Now, members of this particular committee fall into a number of different categories. Some of you are actually full-time state employees, uh, whether you are elected or appointed to your positions. And the conflict of interest law applies to you uh, as a member of this subcommittee as it ordinarily does as part of your day job. If you are not a full-time state employee, you are considered a special state employee and the conflict of interest law still applies to you, but there are some uh, modifications that the law makes in recognition of the fact that you are not a full-time uh, employee. And I'll, I'll run through some of those highlights uh, here as well. So the one thing that I do want to note, though, is regardless of whether you're a full-time or a special state employee, you do have an obligation to complete the state conflict of interest law online training every two years. Uh, the state actually has the Ethics Commission actually just developed a really uh, nice new system. Um, if you're unfamiliar with it, I do have the link here uh, in this slide. I'd be happy to share that with you uh, offline. And uh, uh, if you haven't yet taken that training, uh, we can work through Grace and others uh, to make sure you have access uh, to that link. But you do have to do that once every two years uh, to ensure compliance with the state uh, conflict of interest law. Uh, I do need to update this. You actually don't have to send us our certificate anymore. Uh, because the system uh, tracks uh, compliance uh, digitally at this junction. As you may know, there are essentially two general types of conflicts of interest. There are financial conflicts of interest, and then there are appearances of conflicts of interest. And if you've taken the online course, uh, you're likely fairly familiar with these two concepts. So I won't spend a lot of time on them, but I do think it's always helpful just to mention them uh, to help uh, reacquaint you with these uh, principles uh, in the event you haven't taken the training in some time. The first is the financial conflicts. And as a general matter, if you find yourself in a situation where you are experiencing a financial conflict of interest, you typically have to step away, recuse yourself from that particular matter, and oftentimes file a disclosure with your appointing authority, um, signifying that you do have such a conflict. And the law uh, requires, says that you may not participate in any particular matter that may affect your financial interest or that of an immediate family member or a business organization that you're affiliated with. And I just highlighted a few terms uh, within uh, the definition and it says that it has to involve a particular matter, which means it's a specific situation, whether you're evaluating an application that has been submitted or there's a contract that you're working on or something along those lines. It's not something that might happen in the future or that is remotely possible or it's speculative as to whether it might happen. It has to be an actual situation that you are confronted with, a particular matter that is coming before you uh, as a member of this subcommittee and as a state employee. And it has to affect a financial interest, meaning something involving, as the term suggests, uh, money. But it doesn't have to be that someone is actually offering money or, or something along those lines. It can be that the decision is going to affect an investment that you may have or your job in some way. It has to somehow uh, implicate a financial uh, interest. And it can be both positive and negative. It's not just that you're going to benefit or a family member of yours is going to benefit from a particular decision. It might be that there might be some negative uh, aspect to it or some harm that could result that would be a financial issue as well. And so if you're ever involved here at the subcommittee or the committee level uh, in any decision-making that could have a financial impact on you or an immediate family member, uh, that should signal to you that you may be in financial conflict of interest territory and it is a, a matter that we should address. The second area, it relates to what we call appearances of conflict, though the word appearance doesn't actually appear in the law. Um, it is uh, it generally uh, something in which uh, a circumstances arises in which someone may suggest that you may not be acting in a manner that a reasonable person could conclude that you've done your job without any bias. Um, you have to be able to conduct your, your work impartially. And if there's anything that exists that a reasonable person looking from the outside in might suggest could affect your ability to perform your function here at the subcommittee impartially, 
but it's not a financial conflict, uh, then it might be an appearance conflict. And if you find yourself in that territory, typically you have to just disclose that in writing to your appointing authority, the facts and circumstances of the situation. And once you make that disclosure, you are allowed to continue on um, in, in the work. Of course, your appointing authority may ask you to step aside or, or, or something along those lines, but once you have disclosed an appearance of a conflict, as a general matter, you can continue on uh, performing your job duties. Next, I, I'd like to just remind everyone of the gift restriction. I think you're all likely generally familiar with this. The law says that you may not accept gifts and gratuities of substantial value. And as you likely know, the law and the Ethics Commission has the, uh, uh, defined the term substantial value to mean $50 or more. And you can't accept such gifts if they're given for or because of official acts that are performed or to be performed or given because of your official position. And just by way of reminder, a number of smaller gifts added up together worth $50 or more may also be a violation. If someone offers you a cup of coffee every day, you come in here and you come in here you know, 50 times, that would likely exceed the $50 uh, gift. So it's important just to be aware of that. The other concept that comes up in the conflict of interest law that's important to remember is the unwarranted privilege uh, provision. And the law provides that you should not use or attempt to use your official position to secure your, uh, for yourself or others unwarranted privileges or exemptions which are not available to members of the public. Now that generally just means that you can't uh, go out and tell everyone that you are a member of uh, the GPAC and accordingly you uh, deserve some special attention uh, for something. Um, and, you know, the typical example uh, that comes up in this context is if someone gets pulled over by the police and they give them the old, hey, do you know who I am uh, routine. That is actually an unwarranted privilege and it violates the state conflict of interest law. That is, amongst other reasons, the, uh, the main reason why that is impermissible. The, the, the issue that comes up most with the committee members and subcommittees relates to what is referred to as the divided loyalties section of the conflict of interest law. It's section four of chapter 268A. Uh, and it applies slightly differently uh, depending on whether you're a full-time state employee, whether you are an elected official, uh, or whether you are a special state employee. And I'll cover each of those uh, at a very high level here, but I just wanted to draw your attention uh, to these issues so you are aware of them, um, and we can manage any situation you uh, may find yourself in. As a general matter, of course, the Commonwealth is entitled uh, to an impartial, unbiased performance of your responsibilities where you are a state employee. And that breaks down into a couple of different areas. As a general matter, uh, and this, uh, this applies to full-time state employees, no state employee shall otherwise than as provided by law for the proper discharge of official duties directly or indirectly receive or request compensation from anyone other than the Commonwealth or a state agency in relation to a particular matter in which the Commonwealth or a state agency is a party or has a direct and substantial interest. So what does that mean? Well, again, um, the particular matter issue applies here. So it has to be an actual situation that you find yourself discussing here um, at the uh, committee level. And you have to be, you, in order to uh, find yourself running up against this, you would have to be receiving compensation from someone else in your, presumably in your day job, uh, to work on a matter that's also before you here at the committee. Because the, the state of Massachusetts and the Gaming Commission has a direct and substantial issue and pretty much- Brian Fatman. Join the meeting. In pretty much all of the matters that come before this subcommittee, the commission uh, and the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts have a direct and substantial interest. So if you're being compensated by someone else other than the Commonwealth, uh, you could run into a divided loyalties uh, issue by virtue of your uh, sitting on this committee and discussing the issues that will come before you. 
Similarly, there's a section C below here, you'll see it's, it's very similar, but it's slightly different. It says that no state employee shall otherwise than in the proper discharge of his official duties act as an agent or attorney for anyone in connection with a particular matter in which the Commonwealth or a state agency is a party or has a direct and substantial interest. So again, similar to paragraph A, but it, instead of focusing on whether you're being compensated by someone else, the question is whether you're acting as an agent or attorney for someone else other than the, the Commonwealth um, in a matter that is before this subcommittee. So if you happen to be a lawyer, um, and in your day job, you are offering legal counsel to your client about a matter that's actually before this committee, you could be running afoul of this particular section of the law in that your loyalties may be divided. Similarly, if you're not a lawyer and you're just offering advice or you're participating in a particular matter, maybe the disbursement or the application of funds from the community um, mitigation fund or, or something along those lines, you could be acting as an agent uh, for that particular entity in a matter that the Commonwealth and the Gaming Commission have a direct and substantial interest. For example, if you work for a city or town and you want to submit an application for a grant from the Community Mitigation Fund, you can work on that um, in your day job, but you can't be the one who completes the application and signs the application, uh, seeking those funds, and then appears before the Gaming Commission to answer any questions about the nature of your request. In that event, you would be acting as an agent for someone other than the Commonwealth in that particular matter, which the Commission has an interest. In. So that would be a violation of the divided loyalties section of the statute. Now, I, I don't know if we have any municipal employees here, um, so I won't go through all of these examples, but uh, the most common um, uh, area where this does come up is the one I just mentioned, where folks uh, would be working on mitigation issues um, and uh, then seeking funds from the community mitigation fund. If you are a municipal employee, that is a signal to you that you, you should be just uh, careful and cautious about proceeding in those. Uh, situations. There are ways you can participate in them, but you just need to manage the situation. Um, now, for legislators or elected officials, and I know there are, we do have a number of members of uh, the team who are elected officials. I just wanted to draw your attention to this section of uh, the statute. This is in section four as well. Uh, and there is a carve out from the general provisions of the statute that I just mentioned, and I'll, I'll go through it uh, quickly here. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how likely these things are to come up, but I think it's helpful just to be aware of them. And the, the law says that a member of the general court shall not be subjected uh, to divided loyalties provisions. And I modified this a little bit, but again, it's relating to that compensation provision and the acting as an agent or attorney provision. It says, however, no member of the general court shall personally appear for any compensation other than his legislative salary before a state agency unless one of the following three things are true. Either the particular matter before the state agency is ministerial in nature, or the appearance is before a court of the Commonwealth, or the appearance is in a quasi-judicial proceeding. So these items don't necessarily directly relate to your work here on the subcommittee, but I think it's always helpful just to uh, remind uh, folks of these particular uh, provisions. And then as you can see, the law also defines what a ministerial function is um, in the event that you ever find yourself um, intending to appear before a state agency um, on a, what you would consider to be a minor matter. The law actually defines what those uh, are. The other um, area applies to special state employees. And for folks who are not full-time state employees, um, I, I know you don't get compensated to be here, so we do appreciate your service, of course, um, but that makes you a special state employee by law. And it means that this section of the law does apply to you, but there, it, it's a, in a more limited fashion. The law recognizes that you have a full-time day job and you are providing a service here to the Commonwealth. So you are limited in some ways as to uh, sitting on both sides of the table, if you will, but 
it, it makes the law a little bit more relaxed in certain ways. And the rule is that a special state employee shall be subject to the divided loyalties provisions only in relation to a particular matter in which he has at any time participated as a state employee. So that is um, anything that actually comes before you here at the subcommittee. If that happens to come up in your day job as well, there could be a divided loyalties issue um, or uh, which is within one year, uh, which is or within one year has been a subject of your official responsibility. So if there's something that is uh, falls within the uh, construct of the jurisdiction of this committee and it comes up in your day job, uh, you could be in divided loyalties uh, territory or which is pending in the state agency in which you are serving. So if there's something actively before this particular committee, even if you haven't taken it up yet, uh, it could apply. Um, although that being said, uh, there is also an exception to the exception, which is here in clause C, it says uh, that it shan't, it shan't apply in cases of special state employees who serve uh, on no more than 60 days during any period of 365 consecutive days, which would apply in this, subcommittee, in this committee, unless you uh, happen to meet uh, way more times this year than the committee ever has in the past. So uh, with all that being said, I know I went through that really quickly, uh, but the, the aim of this uh, presentation was not uh, designed to make you experts in the conflict of interest law, uh, but instead just to kind of train your intended to detect when you may be faced with an issue under the conflict uh, of interest law, particularly as it applies to this particular subcommittee. Um, again, uh, there are a number of resources available to you if you have any questions. The State Ethics Committee, I'll pull this down here. The State Ethics Commission itself offers uh, uh, great advice. There's a lawyer of the day uh, available if you uh, ever are inclined to give them a call. Uh, that uh, number is on their website. I can help you connect with them. You're welcome to call me or a member of my team here at the legal, uh, the, uh, legal department at the Gaming uh, Commission. And I know uh, each of you likely have a legal counsel of your own who, of course, uh, you can consult with as well. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair and, and members of the committee, I'm happy to take any questions. Otherwise, um, I will pause. There. Okay, thank you, Todd. Does anybody have any direct uh, questions for Todd? Um, this information is, is uh, complex for sure, uh, but is important. So I would say, particularly for our new committee members, if you do have questions, it's worth reaching out directly to Todd and going through all the material because um, every situation is different and every instance, I think Todd, you would agree, is different between the different individuals asking. But do we have any questions now? Uh, Chairman Serper, this is Paul Bignelli. Uh, could, could the members of this uh, board receive a copy of the uh, all that we would have to go to to do the conflict of interest training and update it. It's I, I think it's been a couple of years since I went through that. So could someone supply that to the board members? Yeah, no certainly. Doubt. Yes, I, and maybe I, I can send did. that to, over I, to Grace. I, I know you um, did that on this. Oh, sorry, Mr. Picknelli. I, I didn't mean to jump in there. No, that's um, right. I, I think you provided it in your deck, but I just didn't have. The time to write it down. So, um, if someone could just email that to us, it would be great. Yeah, yeah. be happy to do that. Send out the link. Thank you. And uh, it's an online. I actually did mine back in January, and um, yeah, we should check to make sure that every, everybody has done it within the past two years. Okay, I think we can move on, right? Um, I just just. Right before we do our next presentation, I do want, I myself want to take a minute to recognize um, what I think we've all witnessed, but the impressive work I think was done by the Gaming Commission over the past several months at implementing the new uh, sports wagering law in the Commonwealth. Um, from, my, from my viewpoint, clearly, I think it was a difficult and complex rollout. And um, I think the commission was successful at bringing the product 
to Massachusetts with a steady hand and with the necessary and um, the paramount integrity necessary for the process. So I wanna thank uh, Chair Judd Stein and the fellow commissioners, the entire team at the Gaming Commission for their work on the project. And of course, uh, I wanna recognize the legislature's leadership for affirmatively bringing sports wagering to the Commonwealth last summer. So I, I just wanted to note that for the group. But that being said, um, I'll turn it over now to Crystal Bochemin, the sports wagering business manager at the Gaming Commission for her presentation and update on sports wagering. Right, Crystal? Great. Thank you. I think Grace is handling the PowerPoint for me. Thank you, Grace. Okay, so I know uh, many of you are already familiar with the sports wagering legislation and how uh, the commission has prepared for the launch, especially given the comments which preceded me, but um, I'm just gonna offer a really brief overview and more focus on the insights from our first 60 days. So I'm gonna go to slide two, Grace. I think the other two. Maybe. I'm not going. Do you want me to? <laughs> I think you're on mute. Grace, you're on mute. And um, I still only see just the cover slide. Um, it's moving on my screen. So let me just undo it and reshare. <laughs> So you know, if you want, you can also use the packet. Everybody did That's receive fun. right the information in the packet. So let's right. see. yeah, I can do it myself too. Yeah. I don't have today, but I've managed it before. So I can do it. Um let's see how oh, here we go. And I see Perfect. it. There we go. Can you is it moving now? Yeah. It. Yes, it's good yeah. now. Love it. Okay. Um so just as a quick update, as of April, Massachusetts is one of the 35 states which have now offered sports wagering. Um, I think the last to come online, I'm not, I had written that down and I don't have it here, so I'm not going to guess, but one just came online last month. Um, so now there are 35. You'll recognize here the key components to Chapter uh, 23N, which is the governing statute for sports wagering in the Commonwealth. The highlights uh, really are the three categories of licensees created. Uh, the two associated tax brackets and our particular legal parameters around age, credit card limits, and uh, restrictions really, and collegiate sports. A little asterisk there because we've been asked in the past, yes, uh, while there is no betting on Massachusetts collegiate sports, there is betting on Massachusetts teams for tournaments, which include four or more teams. Um, this infographic, which briefly showed up and disappeared. So. <laughs> There we go, uh, is just a quick snapshot of the timeline from August 1st, uh, 2022, when the legislation passed through March 10th, 2023, when our online wagering operators launched visibly. Um, and as has been discussed, a lot happened in that time frame, including around 80, as we've guessed, pre-launch public meetings, uh, all dedicated to sports wagering, uh, the review of 14 applications, and in that time frame, the retail launch at our three casinos. Next slide. <laughs> to prepare uh, for going live, a significant number of regulations had to be developed and promulgated, while house rules and internal controls all had to be approved. But in addition, several key processes have been ongoing, including coordination with the Department of Revenue to set up the interface for winnings intercepts due to the state, such as back taxes and child support. The licensing division and our investigations and enforcement bureau has not only been working on the operational licensing, but occupational licensure as well. Um, significant work has gone into developing the catalog of approved events and wagers. Uh, a VSC list for sports wagering has been implemented and all operators are now integrated with MGC newly developed app. And uh, notably GameSense has found a lot of success with their live chat platform. Um, in this world of mobile, uh, that seems to be really beneficial. And of course, as we move forward, we're develop, 
uh, we're developing reporting processes, determining audit schedules, and other regulatory procedures for compliance and oversight. Here you can see the operators who went live on our official launch dates. So you have the three casinos for our retail launch on January 31st, and these six mobile operators for the March 10th launch, which was just ahead of March Madness. As of May, we bring on two more. Better uh, has already received their certificate of operations and Fanatics is preparing for launch in the next couple weeks. And they'll should appear on my slide. There we go. So Better and uh, Fanatics on their way. And then we will have the full spectrum of anticipated licensees for categories one and three on the final slide with category two on the way. And those are Ballybet and Betway. So according to Vixio's sports betting outlook for April, which just arrived uh, like four days ago, the Massachusetts launch was the second largest on, on record. Um, and their quote right there, uh, it was not in your original slide because this report just came out, but essentially that was measured by um, the daily online handle with daily wagers per capita. We can also look at the first month's handle of comparable jurisdictions and markets. Um, important to note here that handle is the total amount of wagers placed where revenue is the margin of handle remaining after payout. So what you see here is revenue and we'll talk about that a little bit, but the Massachusetts handle for the first one was approximately 584 million. And for reference, that's on par with Michigan's first month at 594 million. Um, a lot of people ask about Ohio because that launched in January just ahead of us. And that was over a billion um, in handle. But for reference, in March, it came down to 738 million, which is only a little more um, than we were at. So great reference points there. And as you're seeing on this slide, um, which is an example of the monthly reports we distribute, March was the first month we had both retail and online. So you can see the total taxable sports wagering revenue here at a, um, just over 47 million with 9.3 million in taxes collected and the hold at around 8.5%. So if you're wondering how that revenue weighs comparatively, we were talking handle, but as far as revenues, um, so uh, I pulled some for some similar states. Um, New Jersey was at about 69 million. Connecticut 16.5, Michigan 46, so it runs the gamut. Maryland 48, that's um, a, a, a lot of people were uh, interested in Maryland and Pennsylvania, which was about 66 million. So we were right, um, really successful launch. Um, the next slide will give you a picture of the taxes which have been collected thus far, which was February and March. Um, it's the combined total bringing um, that total to just over 9.5 million. And April's numbers will be out around May 15th. So we'll have a, a new picture. To uh, and I included slide 11 just as a reference for um, anyone who wanted to see how those taxes are allocated. I always find that to be a really great image that we put um, on a website. So here's where we dig into the first 45 days. Um, the Gaming Commission received this report from GeoComply, which is our partner for devo uh, device and location-based monitoring and fraud detection. Uh, this is the first 45 days of online wagering. You can see the largest areas of new users here, um, which was really interesting. And in that time frame, uh, in that 45 days, there were over 91 million transactions on 979,000 devices. It's a mouthful. Um, interestingly, GeoComply, uh, as I said, they are monitoring location and fraud detection. So they also stopped uh, over 187,000 accounts from placing bets outside of Mass, which I think is a really interesting, um, it just shows you what they're doing and how that technology is accurate. Interesting to note from the data, I think, for this crew, uh, GeoComply could actually tell that in Rhode Island and New Hampshire, where you know there's one operator, very limited competition, over 3,000 bettors tried to place a bet from Rhode Island or New Hampshire, and then later crossed to Massachusetts, where they could sec successfully log into their accounts. So it's really, really that accurate um, and interesting that people are interested in the competition we offer. 
Uh, while that 45 day mark wasn't all that long ago, we did ask for some updated numbers for this briefing. So you'll see I also did include the April 30th. And at that point, there were over 950,000 unique uh, sports wagering off uh, sports wagering users, sorry, and very close to 100 million transactions already. By my calculations, that's just under 2 million a day. And in that same 45 day time period, um, this graph really just shows you the market share by operator. Massachusetts is clearly very heavily led by DraftKings and FanDuel. And of course, that also demonstrates how much of a race to um, market share and competition there was for user acquisition, which naturally brought with it a heavy saturation of marketing and a variety of promotions at the onset. We are already seeing that advertising scale back, which we've heard from many other jurisdictions is the case. But the commission was certainly prepared, uh, had researched and emphasized consumer protections all along and wrapped those elements into our regulations. Uh, our regulations are uh, robust and address issues from the, through the gamut of marketing and advertising, from promotional and marketing language that isn't allowed, uh, false advertising, restrictions for minors, events that consist primarily of minors and college campuses, um, very particular in ensuring no messaging is distributed to individuals on PSC lists, our voluntary self-exclusion lists, um, ensuring in, there's no intrusion at sporting events, having particular restrictions on endorsements, and of course, just cohesively ensuring responsible gaming and problem gambling elements are enhanced. So uh, you can tell we've been busy. <laughs> this wasn't originally the last slide in your packet, but I realized it wouldn't really be a proper update uh, about sports wages if I didn't introduce our division as a whole. Uh, Cyril Com uh, Carpenter is the operations manager, business manager, and director band, who is also on this call, I should note. And um, we were formed as a unit in February, hit the ground running, though we'd all uh, been previously involved through our formal roles in various capacities as the um, process unfolded. So, uh, any of us would be willing to answer your questions or uh, that I can take any questions you have right now. Crystal, I know it's kind of impossible. No one has a crystal ball on these on these things, but in terms of the other kind of remaining brick and mortar um, sports books, well, I guess it's two categories of the um, the kiosks, right? I know there's going to be a study and then there's the potential for kiosks coming out, kind of the timeline on that. And then the two remaining, um, pair, you know, pair mutual um, brick and mortar sports books as well. Any timeline on, on those? Um, I think Mark was, maybe he is on this call, but he could, Mark Vanderlyn, and could speak to you more about the timeline of the studies. I know they're undergoing, there's, a, there's been a lot around that. In fact, we talked about it a little bit today on public media. Um, and he could probably dive into that. I uh, think there's also some movement, uh, I think on, on Monday, there might be some update on category two, I'm not sure, but uh, we are, everything's in process. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I could address the, there, there was a study that was required in the um, Sports Wagering Act that we um, look at the feasibility of sports wagering kiosks and bars and restaurants. We are at the, basically at the finish line of selecting um, a successful team to conduct that research. So that should, that should begin soon, um, assuming that procurement um, finishes successfully. Thanks. And the CAT 2 properties are going through licensing and approval process now. So they're kind of going through that process. And, and to add to that, we will be coming, well, right now we have one that has submitted an application. And that's the Raynham uh, facility. Thank Crystal you, Chair. I'm sorry. Thank you. I have a quick question, if I may. Sure. Uh, Crystal, great presentation and uh, congratulations on your on your new role. <laughs> um, question: In on the slide that you shared in regards to the percentage 
of new users or the number of new users in relations to cities and, and cities and towns. Um, is there a possibility to get additional information from that? For example, it would be really interesting to see the number of new users compared to what the percentage of the population. So for example, you might have like 10,000 people using in Quincy, but you know, Boston's a big city, but per percentage wise, it might be higher percentage of folks in Quincy using, engaging in sports betting than people, the folks in Boston. So it'd be interesting just to kind of maybe drill down if that's possible. I'm not sure if that is possible, but that'll be great. Um, and then obviously I have additional requests if, if we can get more data um, specifically around demographics would be really interesting. Yeah, this is not our tool. It's GeoComply, and we certainly dig in. What they're showing in that slide that you only quickly saw is really just the users, and then what percentage of that is our user base. But I'm not sure how deep they dive into you know, per capita or anything like that. So we can we can certainly ask. So always, there's more data in some of these than you could ever imagine. So. Uh, we're learning the system ourselves, but I, I will look into that for you. Are we also, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I have another question if I may, Mark. And, and I'm wondering also, could we use that data as well to maybe, I'm not sure if you find this helpful, Mark, but to determine the number of users and compared to how many folks are utilizing our responsible gambling tools, for example, you know, voluntary self-exclusion and what's the percentage of, if you have 900,000 users, how many folks have voluntary self exclude I just think it makes interesting to do some analysis around the user base versus how people are using certain tools. It just be of great interest. Yeah, actually, um, just a couple of points on that. I think that's a really interesting question, Victor. Um, and it seems like if we know the number of unique users within a, a specific town or city, we could you can begin to take a look at sort of the per capita within that specific geographical area. Um, and utilization of RG tools is very interesting to us and we're slicing and dicing that, that data. And so for example, we just passed a, a RG regulation today um, for plan management tools. And a key piece of that is that we have a carve out to make sure that we're collecting the data from operators on utilization of, the, of that tool, but also of other RG tools that are available. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Crystal. Okay. Um, thank you, Crystal, for the, the information. I found it interesting and also uh, recognizing that I need to dig into the terminology a little bit more myself, so I might be in touch soon to do that. But thank you so much. Any other questions uh, for Crystal or shall we move on? Um, all right, we'll move on. Um, I'm going to move to our research agenda. So for this segment, I need to reaffirm to the membership that um, our governing statute, Chapter 23 of the Expanded Gaming Act, Section 68, designates that our body will discuss matters of gaming policy, advises, and makes recommendations. As such, we will now hear from Mark Vinderlinden. Director of Research and Responsible Gaming at the Commission regarding the Mass Gaming Commission's potential research agenda for fiscal year 2024. I encourage the fellow committee members to listen to Mark's presentation, offer any insight and input you have regarding his proposed agenda, and the input provided here today at this meeting will be brought back to the commissioners for their consideration for the 2024 agenda. Um, so Mark, with that, um, I'll let you go. I'll, I'll mention we do have two presentations, yours and one other uh, scheduled today and a 4.30 end time. Maybe we can push past that a tiny bit, but just please keep that in mind. Great. Uh, thank you, Chair Serpa, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Mark Vanderlinden, Director of Research and Responsible Gaming at the, the Mass Gaming Commission. I have two uh, documents in your packet today. One is the March 2023 20, uh, research update, and the other is a memo um, 
outlining the proposed FY24 gaming research agenda. Um, I'm going to try to truncate my, uh, my presentation for you um, because I really am interested in the feedback that you have. Um, so I'm not going into great detail in the research update, but just a few um, highlights or I guess updates. Um, one, earlier today, we had a presentation and released the final report. Um, it's a public safety report assessing the influence of gambling on public safety, um, specifically looking at Everett and the surrounding communities. So this is the latest edition of our public safety research. Um, second, I wanted to just highlight in terms of knowledge mobilization. Um, yesterday, we, we uh, announced a partnership with the um, International Gambling Counselor Certification Board in order to use research that comes from this research agenda. Um, it's being forwarded to uh, gambling um, and gaming counselors, clin clinicians, and helping professionals. Um, so they were specifically interested in our community engaged research. Uh, Dr. Bonnie Andrews, who is the research manager here at the Gaming Commission, has tailored some of our research and delivered it. Uh, to that, that group, and that will be an ongoing relationship. And then finally, um, just as a highlight of how this group is really important in advising the gaming research agenda last year, it wasn't on the uh, research agenda when I initially proposed it, but there was a request that we do a deeper dive into the casino. Uh, workforce, taking a look at, at the quality of jobs and what types of jobs they are and what, what are opportunities for advancement. We included that in, in our annual research agenda for fiscal year 23. You'll see it briefly mentioned in the March 2023 research update, but, the, but it's exactly that. We're doing a deeper dive in, in casino jobs and trying to um, take a look at using payroll data to analyze patterns of high, hiring compensation, mobility, and turnover in casinos in the Commonwealth. Um, so uh, I'll be looking for that report soon. Um, Mr. McNeil, I'm sure that will be a report of, of special interest for you. Um, so moving directly then over to the next um, uh, item in your packet is the proposed FY24 gaming research agenda. I'm going to try to kind of get into the meat and bones of this. But again, the Expanded Gaming Act um, enshrines the role of research um, by requiring an annual research agenda. This is not a one-off. This is not a, an isolated report or study that's required, but this is ongoing. And that is special in Massachusetts and there's no other state that, that requires this. Um, and specifically, this research agenda is to examine the social and economic effects of expanded game of gambling and obtain scientific information relative to neuroscience, psychology, sociology, epidemiology, and etiology of gambling. So um, I've spent the better part of 10 years wrapping my head around all of the different directions that we can go with this, with this research agenda. Um, and the beauty is we will continue to, to plug away at this, this very broad mandate um, uh, next year and in the years to come. Um, we have a research strategic plan in order to help organize that. It's broken into seven key areas. It's economic research, social research, community engaged research, which that is a specific area where uh, taking a look at uh, groups and communities, which largely are greater, greater or risk of gambling related harm. We have a public safety research agenda, which I mentioned an example of that just a minute ago. Um, we also have a component that does evaluation of responsible gaming programs that, that are being employed by the Gaming Commission to mitigate and prevent gambling related harm. Um, we had a large cohort study um, that, uh, which took a look at the course of gambling behavior over time. It led to um, and contributed to the internationally recognized lower risk gambling guidelines. Um, and then finally, data sharing, um, which is sounds, uh, sounds boring, but really it's about, it's about transparency and making the data available to researchers um, 
so around around the world, giving them access to our raw data so they can do their own analyses. Um, so the proposed FY24 gaming research agenda, it's um, included in your packet um, a couple pages in. Um, you'll see that the, uh, the total of this estimated research agenda is $1,865,000. Um, the research agenda is funded out of the Public Health Trust Fund, which is a portion of revenue um, from our Category 1 licensees, as well as an assessment across all, all gaming licensees. Um, this is a, a larger research agenda than it has been in the past, or specifically last year. And this is largely due because we're really interested in continuing an exploration of sports wagering in the Commonwealth. Um, this is our great opportunity to establish some baselines, to get some uh, early information about the impacts of sports wagering in the Commonwealth. Um, so to begin breaking it, it down um, into the specific deliverables, and I have this included in your pack, and you'll notice that I have um, a, the, the name of the study that we're proposing, a very brief description of that study um, and the uh, how it relates back to the, the gaming statute. Um, and I just a, a caveat, we, you know, at this stage of the research agenda, um, we have a general description of it, we have a, sort of a general proposal of it, but it's not a detailed sort of scoping document um, going into details about methodology and, and overall goals and objectives. Um, once we, we get sort of the green light from the get your advice and the green light from the commission, at that point, we would put a lot more of this and meat on the bones of, of how we would advance these specific studies. Um, so under social and economic re research, we're proposing um, an integrated social and economic impacts report. This is a big report. This is taking a look at the overall impacts of gambling in Massachusetts from 2000, so from when the very first casino opened. It, it utilizes um, uh, the follow-up general population survey, which takes a look at gambling behavior. Um, now compared to 2013, when we did a baseline of this, it also interestingly uses a matched, um, a matched community. So taking a look at communities that didn't receive casinos or don't have casinos and comparing them to communities that do, so you can begin to say, what would have happened had a casino not been placed in, in Springfield? Um, that will be a, a large comprehensive social and economic report. Um, we're also proposing um, moving more towards online surveys. Um, they're just in brief, survey methodology is complicated and oftentimes very expensive. Online panels provide an opportunity to um, at a lower cost to get a general um, impression of gambling behavior in the state. Um, online panels um, are typically representative of the overall general population. So that's, that's an important piece. But we've spent some time over the past year trying to come as close as we can to get uh, these types of online panels representative of the general population. So you'll see the next couple deliverables really focus on these online panels. Um, the first is what we call o OPS, online uh, panel survey. Um, this will be a report that will be released um, and using data that was captured in FY22 and FY23. Um, this will align with the general or the follow-up general population survey and using that more expensive um, survey methodology that is representative of the general population. Um, we are proposing using AirSage data, basically mobile phone data to understand and track out-of-state visitorship. Um, comparing this to a, a study that was done by a well-known um, gambling researcher, Clyde Barrow, um, that was done prior to the first casino opening in Massachusetts. This answers that, that question that goes way back to the 2011 Expanded Gaming Act of who's coming what, what impact does casinos have in visitorship to Massachusetts casinos? 
Um, and then the broader question of what's the overall economic impact of, of this type of visitorship or tourism coming, coming to the state. Um, moving on down, we will be administering another online panel survey um, in March of 2024, which continues that sort of timeline of online panels to continue to monitor and understand sports wagering behavior, but gambling behavior over, overall. Um, the past couple of years, we've included what we call an ad hoc report, um, recognizing that uh, research interests, research questions will tend to crop up um, after the research agenda is approved. So providing some space and an allocation of funds so that we can take on additional projects as, as needed. Um, public safety research. Um, I mentioned that we um, just finished the Everett and surrounding community public safety report. We're wrapping up a Springfield public safety report. We haven't done a public safety report in Plainville now for um, a few years. So we were, were proposing that we head back down to Plainville um, and that our prime uh, analyst and their team um, uh, do that survey. We're also proposing um, adding to the public safety uh, category an assessment on the influence of expanded gaming on human trafficking in Massachusetts. And we had a long discussion about this in, in this morning community. This is really difficult to assess um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and it's not captured in your typical public safety study. Um, you may get glimmers of it. You may, in fact, we, we got glimmers of it um, in some of our community engaged research. There's enough evidence for us to say that we, we would like to have a better understanding of this so that um, we can address it more effectively um, from the commission, but also from, from law enforcement in the state. Um, for community engaged research, um, a couple things here. We're, we're proposing that we continue an investment in this community engaged research by supporting um, two or two more community engaged research projects. Um, and that would be funded out of our traditional funding of the Public Health Trust Fund. But um, we, as, as Chair uh, Jed Stein mentioned, there's also an opportunity through the Community Mitigation Fund. Um, to provide uh, some funding for community engaged research from, from that. Um, there's a couple different types of funding from the community mitigation fund. There's pilot funding for groups that haven't completely formed the research question, but have some ideas so they can uh, use that funding to, to come up with a more solid research plan. And then there's a type two, which is that implementation. Um, so much more funding in order to conduct the research for groups that have a well-formed research idea and plan in place. Um, we're proposing uh, continuing this commitment in data sharing. So we have what we call MODE, the Massachusetts Open Data Exchange. We have several data sets that currently exist in, in MODE and um, researchers can apply to use that. Um, we're, we're also continuing to plug away on what we call the Section 97 data set, which is all of the player data that exists within casinos anonymized, deposited into this repository and made available for research purposes. Um, so that uh, we said last year we're very close. We continue to plug away um, at this requirement and hope to have that available very soon. And it's a collaboration with the Department of Public Health. It's a collaboration with, with CHIA, the Center for Health Information and Analytics. Um, responsible gaming evaluation. We were actually, we have funding um, through the International Center for Responsible Gaming right now to do an evaluation of the Play My Way uh, program that, that was mentioned. Um, we are currently doing an evaluation of the GameSense program um, that should be wrapping up over, over the summer. Um, this is an ongoing commitment. Responsible gaming is, is something that um, is a high priority of the commission um, as we, we seek to prevent and mitigate gambling related harm. So there's a couple different options of evaluation projects that, that we're proposing. 
um, uh, either one, an evaluation of some of some of the sports wagering responsible gaming tools, um, or two, there is uh, specifically there's temporary prohibitions that um, uh, are required and included in uh, MGC regulation. Um, there's an opportunity perhaps to do some pilot projects uh, within those, um, within that requirement that we, we would want to evaluate the effectiveness of and consider advancing. Um, sports wagering research, it wasn't one of our seven categories that we identified in our strategic plan, but we're proposing a series of studies um, related to sports wagering. First is an eye gaming study, while not sports wagering, eye gaming, it, and it's not currently available in Massachusetts. Um, it's available in a few other states. I think there's six states in the US that allow for eye gaming. Um, and if we continue to look down the road of what is the evolution of gaming in this country, we want to pay attention to, to eye gaming as a possibility and have a better understanding of what the potential public health impacts are of, of eye gaming. Um, I mentioned the kiosk study, um, so understanding the feasibility of kiosks and bars and restaurants. That is in the final stages of procurement, will largely be carried out in FY24. Um, there was also in the Sports Wagering Act a specific study looking at minority women and veteran owned business enterprises in sports wagering. Um, that is something that we wanted to allow the sports wagering industry to kind of find its footing over the, the next several months. And it seems optimal to, to launch a study like that um, in the summer, early fall of FY24. Um, and then finally, the, the final study on sports wagering um, that we're proposing is a study looking at um, different existing marketing affiliate payment structures. So basically, it's a study looking, doing a deeper dive of gambling advertising um, and ways that advertising um, is structured in, in the state and looking at its, at its impact on players. We have a broader advertising study that is currently underway that was included in in last year's research agenda, um, the research team at UMass Amherst is, is working on that study now. That deliverable is expected um, over the summer. So taking it broad and becoming a little bit more narrowly focused on looking at impacts of advertising on, on Massachusetts residents. Finally, um, a continued commitment to our research review process. Uh, our, we have a team of outside experts that review every single research project that comes to the commission, um, reviewing those before we would consider them final. They often advise us on, on a range of research matters as well. And then finally is this continued commitment towards knowledge translation and exchange. We have over 60 reports and studies that have been published by the Gaming Commission. Our biggest challenge is making it is mobilizing it. And so when I talk about the International Gambling Certification Board, it's a perfect example of knowledge mobilization, um, looking at ways that we can continue to mobilize and use that research in, in Massachusetts to inform policy and to inform practice. Um, that's the proposed research agenda. Um, I'm gonna take a breath and I'm going to turn it over to this group to tell me what they think and where they think we should go. Mark, thank you. It's certainly an impressive and substantive collection of projects that you've proposed. Um, so group, I know that Mark is interested in hearing our feedback and commentary. Um, so what did you think of Mark's proposed agenda? For some context, last year, we, um, when Mark went through the statutorily required exercise, uh, this group did say and note that we didn't have sports wagering on, um, as a, a research topic for those who are on the committee last year, you remember that. That did um, get adopted by the commission and a study was done um, by UMass and was informed, informed policy. So, 
this committee's input is so valuable. Thanks for reminding me of that, uh, Chair Jetstein. That that you're right. It was that study as well as the um, workforce study. Yes. I don't know if this is too granular, uh, Mark, and I haven't I haven't read the study that came out today, but um, on the public safety, um, is there a dollar amount attached? Did you attach like a dollar amount that Everett and surrounding communities um, spends, or I guess it would be the state police and, and local police spends um, per year on on Encore? Um, we didn't take a, we, we took a look only at crimes, calls for service and collision. So actual police data, we did not uh, connect that to expenditures on public safety workforce. Okay. I know that there's a debate right now around the community, community benefits agreement, um, community host agreement, excuse me, getting um, renegotiated. So um, that might factor in there, but um, I guess how, having the hours in the call log is is important too in calculating that. Okay, um, we'll take that that feedback, and as we we think about public safety research, um, we could talk to our crime analyst about um, how our public safety team how that how that can be integrated. We use a group called Justice Research Associates. Um, there's a couple individuals that are nationally recognized camp crime analysts um, with great experience. We'll, we'll mention that. Thanks, Mark. Okay, other questions or comments from Mark? As I say, Mark, I thought it was, it's, it's an aggressive and a comprehensive list. I'm sure you may get feedback from others over time, but I think as presented here, it's a, um, a valid set of projects that we should move forward with. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Chair, I have one question or comment, if I may, and I know we're up against the time, so I'll be no, really please. brief. No, uh, no. Yes. Please. Victor, thank you. So, Mark, thank you for the presentation. I really appreciate it. I, I just want to reiterate and also want to acknowledge that I know that you've been open to the comment that I'm about to make, but I just want to um, preface that by saying that. But I, but I really want to continue to stress the importance within the, the totality of the research agenda that we think critically about equity in all aspects of the work, specifically because we understand from research that people of color are disproportionately impacted by gambling. And I continue to be concerned about the notion that, although I appreciate the, the funding and the opportunity for community-led um, uh, community research, uh, it is also vastly um, not funded at the same level as the general research. And I think that there's an opportunity uh, to continue to integrate those equity principles and specifically representation within the larger research. And I know that, again, I want to reiterate that you've been open to that. I've, I've, I know I stated that here, and I know that you have looked at that and continue to work towards that, but I just want to uh, continue to lift that up, uh, of the importance of that uh, in, in the continued research moving forward. Yeah, thanks for carrying the voice for that, Victor. I do appreciate that. Um, you, Leveraging and looking to the Community Mitigation Fund is, is an expansion of the community engaged research. Um, you mentioned it. Uh, Chair Judd Stein is also a huge advocate of our community engaged research category. Um, we, we brought this to the Gaming Research Advisory Committee a couple of weeks ago, um, had a long discussion about this specific research category and ways that we can continue to evolve it to make sure that we're, we, we are considering equity and inclusion, looking at alternative funding structures. So um, it doesn't, it, I appreciate your comments and, and it doesn't escape us the importance of that. Oh, thank you, Mark. And thank you, Victor, because that, that is, those are important topics and um, we'll make note of them here. Um, so I know that I am very interested in learning more about the Community Mitigation Fund. We are at our scheduled stop time, but if the group is amenable, if we could push through the presentation and, and do that, I'm happy to. Is, is that uh, a consensus that we should do that? 
I'm a very fast talker, if you haven't learned already. <laughs> hey, Typical right, boss. I, I got a few affirmative thumbs up, so let's do that. Um, and 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 Victor, um, Jamie, don't don't go fast. Let's let's do it right. But uh, so I'll turn it over now to Jamie McNeil from Unite here, Local Twenty Six, to speak about the Community Mitigation Fund and the impact it's had on his organization. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chair. I appreciate it, and I, I am conscious of people's time. So, um, and and please forgive my my PowerPoint. This is. Um, yeah, I missed this class in high school. Um, I, I actually don't think there was PowerPoint um, when I was in high school, but I'll, I'll go through this as quick as I can. So I think you all know, you're familiar with the Community, community Mitigation Fund, um, what it is. Um, I wanna really thank um, Chair Judd Stein um, in conversations with her. Um, she really kind of uh, motivated me to, to make this presentation and really put a face on um, the Community Mitigation Fund and, and um, who, who it really has helped in terms of workforce development. Um, so, um, you know, here's some, here's some facts about the, about the, about the funds. Um, um, I think we, you know, we're all familiar. We can go to the next slide. So, um, so I'm on the board. Um, this is actually a really great story um, and we're not that great at telling it, but back in the late nineties, early two thousands, when I first joined the union, um, um, housekeepers and hotel workers started a training center, um, union hotel housekeepers and hotel workers started um, a training fund that funded a training center that was established in 2004. And um, it was initially for um, the unionized hotel workforce. Um, they, um, if anyone has worked in the hospitality industry, um, there is a constant kind of movement amongst the different trades and skills. So housekeepers often move up to be a um, banquet server, um, which is slightly better paying. You know, a bartender might want to go over to banquet server or a banquet server might want to become a bartender. So there's all these different skills and trades and um, hotel work is kind of unique in that way. Uh, you can have an entire training center just based off the different skills and the technology is also always changing. Um, so um, we train on that, but it's a separate 501c3 minority owned uh, nonprofit. Um, I'm just one of five board members, um, but they are our um, training provider. And um, the great thing about them being independent is um, they can get uh, grants to um, work on special projects and bring new folks into the industry, right? That's what we're always hear hearing, especially lately. Um, from the hotels and, and the different food service um, providers. Um, and this is about 70% of the hotels are in the union in Boston, um, including Encore. So go to the next slide. So um, Best um, Hospitality um, has been lucky enough to receive um, funding for the last three years um, from the Community Mitigation Fund. Um, uh, and the way the fund works is the train best partners with, um, I believe it's called a, a regional consortium, right? That's that's who gets the money. But then um, we partner with with that consortium, whether it's the PIC, uh, excuse me, Private Industry Council, um, City of Boston, uh, Office of Workforce Development, or Mass Hire, Metro North. Um, we partner with them to do the actual training. Um, so in the last three years, we've um, been able to serve 149 clients. And the caveat is the next slide. Um, so 149 clients, but there's been amongst those 149 clients, 1,135 enrollments. So enrollments is all the different classes. Um, the reason I bring that up is a lot of the folks we deal with, um, excuse me, a lot of the folks we train, um, they have significant barriers to entering um, the job force, the, uh, the, excuse me, the workforce or the hospitality industry. So if somebody's coming to do an English class, they're also potentially getting a citizenship class as well. They are also probably trying to get um, educated on computers. Um, so we work with Techno that goes home so they can get a laptop when they go home. Um, a lot of hotels really focus on CPR and, um, kind of active um, uh, situations. Hotels have different protocols around 
um, what to do if there's an emergency situation in the hotel. Um, and then there's the actual job itself, right? So hospitality, serve safe, tips, whatever the job is. Um, and some folks might have physical barriers, you know, working on their ergonomics, right? And this leads to a lot of retention in the job, you know, focusing on things like ergonomics where um, a hotel might not have the ability to provide that. And then I put at the end, the biggest, and I, and I, I highlighted it in the list is career coaching, right? Having somebody full-time to follow up. Did you send the resume? Did you make the phone call? Did you send another email? You know, did you physically go down there to talk to the general manager? You know, having those wraparound services is so important. So um, again, 149 folks, but um, 11, over 1100 uh, different classes that they took. So you can go to the next slide. So this is some a demographic um, slice here. Um, you know, this probably shouldn't come as any surprise, um, but this is um, this is pretty fairly representative of the hospitality industry. Um, you know, people always are are a bit shocked on the education, um, but you know, so many of our members and folks coming in to join the industry um, are you know are 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 educated in the country they came from and um, they're learning um, a new language, they're learning new skills coming to this country. So go to the next slide. Um, this is um, the, for those 149, um, where those folks came from. Um, as you can see, it's a lot of folks from Boston um, working with the PIC, working with um, the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development, but You'll also see uh, surrounding communities, Everett's a big, um, um, Everett ends the surrounding communities to, to Encore, um, given the, North, uh, um, the Workforce and Development Board. Um, you also see Quincy's in there because it kind of a bit of, uh, of an outlier. Um, Quincy, for folks who don't know, is a fairly heavily, it's, it's a hospitality city. Um, we have an incredible amount of members from Quincy. Um, it's just kind of a, a, an affordable place on the T that a number of folks who have been in the hospitality industry for a long time um, um, live. And again, maybe I'm saying too much about this, but um, um, during COVID, a, a lot of people lost their jobs in hotels and needed to get kind of re, they didn't know the new technology, they needed to either were moving into a job at Encore, which opened much earlier than the hotels. Um, and so they're getting kind of reconnected to the workforce. And I think that's where you see a lot of the Quincy residents there. So um, go to the next slide. So this is, this is really what I was trying to get at, you know, and I think, um, Chair Judge Stein, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I really want to put a, a, a face on, um, on this fund and in the work we do. And um, this is um, this is Song Quin Lin. Lin. Um, he's an um, immigrant from China. He had very, um, he came to us as a friend of a member. He heard about our program kind of through word of mouth, um, had very, very, very limited um, English skills. Um, he was cleaning Airbnbs, um, making less than $20 an hour through a, a, a kind of a temp agency that, that, that cleans these um, different residential units that are used as Airbnbs. Um, really wanted a full-time job, really wanted a good wage, really wanted benefits, really wanted to, you know, have a stable life and um, found out about the program through the Community Mitigation Fund uh, funds. Um, we were able to train him in our English class. He was a quick study. He learned English incredibly quick, made him available for our, pre uh, our hotel pre-apprenticeship um, program. And we're able to, um, he was a grade A student um, and got a job at an area hotel making um, 27, 21 an hour with full benefits, a pension, you know, the legal, all the union benefits. Um, and, um, you know, is a, his, his motto now is I want to get everybody else, I, you know, all my neighbors, everyone else I work with to be able to get a similar job to me and, and go through the best hospitality program and um, is really our best advocate for uh, working in the hospitality industry. So um, anyway, I just wanted to kind of put a, 
a, a face on. He's he's um, kind of the one of the many many success stories um, that is uh, possible through the Community Mitigation Fund and the Mass Gaming Commission. So I'm happy to answer any questions folks might have. Yeah, no, thank you, Jamie. That's super inspiring, right? The best program and seeing a real world example of it being used. So sure, are there others with questions about the program and how Jamie's organization put it to work? Chairman Serpa, this is Paul Piccoli uh, again. Um, it's been quite some time since we've had a, a GPAC uh, meeting and I don't believe the uh, the Community Mitigation Fund uh, would uh, recap, if you will, for last year's expenditures were shared with the committee. And we're wondering if that, uh, if that could be shared with the committee at this point in time. And maybe uh, uh, someone other than yourself, since you're new to the committee, might, uh, might have that information. Oh yeah, uh, well, yeah, I, uh, we certainly can pull it and get it distributed. And Kathy, did you mention a number? Was it 38 million? Did I hear that number earlier today? We can uh, we can get the details. And you know, Paul, I I was remiss not bringing that today because, of course, we we didn't have that meeting last year during um, transition leadership right. and also our busy time. I would um, be remiss to try to capture it appropriately. So what we could do, perhaps Grace, is have uh, Chief Delaney and Lily and Mary put together um, a summary of last year's and then be prepared for our next GPAC meeting to have that fulsome report that I did mention. Uh, that would be helpful, thank you. And it's just because of the timing of uh, uh, this meeting to the last meeting, really. Yes, that's really right. And, and Paul, um, for Correct me, um, it's been a long day. I started at 8.30 and we had a fulsome uh, public meeting from uh, that moment until about quarter of three, but we did right near the conclusion of our last meeting, award $500,000 to the type of training that Jamie just went over to um, the uh, Region B area, no, uh, to the Region A area that will, I think, actually fund the program that Jamie just Describe and then 535,000 to the Western Region B area for training. So um, I can give you that quick snapshot for today's work. Okay, meeting. terrific. That's going forward, but you need that report uh, from the rear view. And I, and again, my apologies for not remembering you had, didn't have that. Well, great. thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I'm sure we'll, we'll uh, look through it when we receive it and be encouraged by what we find. Oh, yes. I think you're right on the number, uh, Chair Serpa, but I, I, I'm, there's a lot of numbers that, that come through us and I don't want to be, uh, make a mistake. I think it was the number, it was your number. So if I'm okay. right, you're right. Okay, um, I guess I should check at this point, if there's no other questions for Jamie, um, you know, are there other members any other members who have uh, quick updates on their activities uh, right now uh, on behalf of the committee, anything that they wanted to share with the group about your work or what's going on in your region? Okay, great. Um, so this kind of segues perfectly. We should probably talk about um, the next uh, GPAC meetings, right? Uh, so it is May. Um, I would suggest, uh, unless something specific comes up or somebody has a specific request that they wanna bring to bear, that we would meet uh, early fall uh, for our next meeting. What Do people feel like that's the right time for our next discussion? No, okay, great. We'll say yes, and, and, and you know, if something comes up, we can reach out and get a hold of folks uh, to put another meeting together. And for the future agenda items, I'll take any any recommendations that people have here, or if you want to get in touch with me. But I certainly would suggest that we, at a minimum, uh, you know, focus on uh, a report from one of the other two standing subcommittees. Um, particularly for the new members, that would be useful. 
Uh, I can work with Chair Judd Stein to figure out what would be appropriate, but I, I would certainly have that happen unless people have ideas that they want to share, other ideas. Sounds good? Everybody sounds good? Great. So we'll do that. Um, Grace, I think we need to not move to the minutes, the approval of the minutes from the prior two meetings, correct? Because we don't have our, our meeting attendee quorum, is that right? Correct, yeah. So we will keep those in draft form and we can vote on them at a future meeting. Okay, so we'll do those at our next meeting. And um, next item on our agenda is to adjourn, but let me check to make sure there aren't other comments or questions that people want to um, bring, bring out in this meeting. I certainly enjoyed the first meeting. It went quickly and um, there's a lot of information, a lot of good work being done, but I'd be curious to know if everybody else felt this was a, uh, a good first meeting of 2023. Victor, yeah. Hey. I did a great job, Chair. Jamie, thank you. Paul, thank you. Okay. Um, well, then why don't we move to adjourning? Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Make a motion. So second. A second. second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Really, everybody, this was great. I appreciate your time. I know Chair Judd Stein appreciates everyone's time and uh, interest and concern for, for everything that's being done. So let's uh, continue with that as much as possible.